Welcome back to Gen Z Speaks. I am back with my co-hosts, Janish Thanky. How you doing, man? Doing good, man. Beginning of the week, start off strong. Yep, gotta start. Gotta start on Monday off strong, always. Uh, Matt, how you doing, man? Doing great, man. In terms of myself, but economy's kind of kicking ass right now, so you know, <laughs> sticking in there. You, man? How are you? Yeah, just taking it one day at a time. I just finished a really killer. Um, workout my boxing is getting better i've been using the speed bag there we go uh the box bag in general but yeah it just boxing is one of those things where i notice like it just gets you going like it just like you just feel pissed off at the gym and that like yeah. helps you you know like lift and like you just feel better like i feel so much better now that's what's up bro all right let's dive right in so we'll continue our conversation on kyle rittenhouse um as most people who are watching or listening probably know that Kyle Rinhouse was acquitted on all, all of the five charges that he was accused of. The, the jury found him not guilty on all counts. Um, what are your guys' immediate reactions? Um, do you think the jury re- reached the right decision on a legal basis? In, in just your analysis in general, um, we know a lot more now than we did last week. Again, the jury spent like three days um, you know, coming to this decision. So they clearly <laughs> took their time. They took hours. So what, what is your guys' uh, reaction to that? Yeah, so off the bat, so he, here's the deal, right? So he was acquitted on all charges, and I don't agree for him to be acquitted on all charges, right? Even though you know there was an act of self-defense in there, I don't believe he should have murdered them for the act that was committed, right? Like he got hit with a skateboard, you know? That's brutal. That sucks, you know? But to kill somebody, to shoot somebody and kill somebody, right? Or then he, we we're watching the Tucker Carlson uh, interview earlier, and it, he goes, "Oh, Mr. Rosenbaum uh, had threatened to kill me, right? Yeah, sure, threat is one thing, but to he actually killed Mr. Rosenbaum, right? He, the Rosenbaum just threatened, and then a threat and an actual act is completely different. Um, I like to say, um, you know, a man's only as good as his word, right? But the thing is, he actually went ahead and killed the guy without, you know, further notice. But uh, off the bat, I, I don't think he should have been acquitted for everything. But I do think um, he shouldn't have been uh, taken in for everything, right? So I, I think there's some things he should have been taken in for and some things he shouldn't have. What do you think, Janish? Yeah, I mean, as far as, like, legalities go, you know, the laws on in that state and everything, he's found um, not guilty. But... I also just think the prosecution did a horrible job. I mean, when you use Call of Duty and um, TikTok usernames as your main argument against the, the um, against the defense, your case is not going to be that good. And I feel like they could have made stronger arguments and could have made stronger points to, you know, show uh, why Kyle House was at fault. But um, I, yeah, I just think as far as the actual case goes, the prosecution did a horrible job. Yeah, so just to give the audience some perspective on the charges he faced, he faced uh, seven charges in total. Five of them were the first five that that the jury decided on because the judge dismissed the other two were first degree intentional homicide. The second charge was attempted first degree intentional homicide, first degree reckless homicide, first degree recklessly endangering safety. And the last charge was first degree recklessly endangering safety. So I think, in my opinion, um, it clearly charging him on a first degree reckless homicide basis was a bit extreme because that charge carries up to 60 years in prison. The only charge that I, in my personal opinion, that the prosecution could have made a better case of, but they did not, was count number three, which was um, first degree recklessly endangering safety. I, th- I believe the, the prosecution offered uh, the jury to consider a second degree recklessly endangering safety charge, but clearly they found him not guilty of the, uh, of the actual first degree charge. So in my opinion, um, you know, we, we, looked, we looked at the videos, right? We saw his testimony. We saw the defense, the prosecution, Legally speaking, right, Kyle did have a case of self-defense, right? Maybe, you know, some people think it was weak. Some people was strong. He did. It wasn't just that, in my opinion, let me just preface it by saying, I don't think Kyle 
planned on going to Kenosha to kill people. I don't think that was his intention. Uh, again, I do think he's an idiot. And some people think that's, you know, uh, controversial to say, you know, the conservative is kind of putting Kyle on this pedestal. They're treating him like this hero. He is not a hero. Two people are dead because Kyle Rittenhouse was in Kenosha. That's just, that's just a fact, right? If, had he, had Kyle not been there, he would not, two people would not be dead right now. And, and if you look at it from a logical perspective, objectively, right? Kyle being there was a negative. Now, did he use self-defense? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a really, it's really tough to, to, to make that judgment because I was not a juror. I did not sit through all those sessions with my fellow jurors. I did not watch the entire trial, right? I just did not do that. So I don't think it's, it would be fair of me to make a judgment on that, but I will say that again, I will say that, that, that count number three, recklessly endangering safety of the reporter. I don't know if you guys remember, but as Kyle was shooting in Rosenbaum, there was a reporter in the line of fire and Kyle could have potentially hit him. And so is that reckless of him without regard to human life? It, it looks to me, it appears to me from the video, it is, right? And um, again, I, I just have my, I just want to share my opinion on like the, like how this trial affects American politics. I really, really think that we need to stop with these culture wars, right? At the end of the day, we have to like start looking at things objectively. I don't know if you guys remember, but when this first broke out, Kyle is right about this and the conservatives are right. The liberal media was just treating this as this guy was a, a white supremacist who was just straight up a racist guy looking for trouble, looking to kill BLM protesters. That's clearly not the case. Now, I don't know if he's racist or not. I've never met him. I've never known him. I've never interacted with him. So I can't make that judgment. But, but I really do think that white privilege had something to do with this, right? Like nobody, no person of color would just show up with a gun, right? To a protest, expecting that things fix things up, right? Like, um, so I, I honestly don't know. If I, I'm really like, I'm still not clear about like what my opinion is in terms of the legalities, but I will say, Again, I know I'm repeating myself, but like we got to like stop using this as an issue to divide us. And the conservatives have to stop treating Kyle as a hero. And the liberal media, they have to, to stop like making judgments and just making people guilty until proven innocent. Like that's a really constitutionally, our founders did a really good job of establishing this precedent that a person is innocent until proven guilty. These days in the media, people are guilty until proven innocent. And that is not a good precedent to set. And that just, that's just, I think, a recipe for disaster. And so we need to stop doing that. We need to look at the facts and not just jump to conclusions that we want to be true, right? That's what I think happened in this case. Everybody has their opinion and they want their opinion to be justified. And I think that's one of the problems, but that, that's what I think. Do, what do you guys think about, do you agree with that or? Yeah, yeah I so, mean, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think in a way, Kyle did act in self-defense. I'm going to put heavy quotations on that. But I, I just think that he shouldn't have been in this that situation to begin with. I think that's the problem there. Like, he, the way he, the, 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 his mistake was getting in that situation in the first place, I think. And, you know, when you come there with a sword rifle, you know, trying to, uh, you know, seem threatening to other people and stuff, you and then there's all these riots going on, you're going to kind of seem threatening to other people. And maybe that's why, um, you know, he got himself in that situation. But I, I feel like it's more of that, what Ibrahim said is like, I don't think, you know, he was trying to look to kill people, but he's an idiot. That That's all I have to say at the end of the day. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, real quick. So in terms of like, I don't have anything to say in, in terms of like his privilege. I don't, I don't know if that had to do with anything. I don't like to think that has to do with anything. Um, but just like objectively looking at, at what it is, right? Obviously, Kyle, what you said is 100% true. Like maybe Kyle didn't necessarily go there to kill people, right? Maybe the AR was just like an intimidation tactic, you know, to keep them away from the businesses or regardless of what it was, right? The fact of the matter is he killed two people just because the other two people weren't like, okay. So just because he was there, right? And he was in the wrong for, for killing two people doesn't mean that you know, Rosenbaum and the other people were right. They weren't right to be there either. They, they weren't right to hit him in the head with a skateboard. They weren't right to, you know, incite riot like they were. 
So just because I just want to make this clear, just because we're saying that, you know, he was wrong in certain, in certain tasks and certain motives that he did doesn't make the other side, right. Just because he was there and killing people. And we don't think it was right that he killed people. Doesn't make it right that Rosenbaum was there, you know, threatening people, hitting people with skateboards, him getting hit in the head with a rock. You know, that's obviously not okay either. And I just want to make that clear because, you know, you know, we're a small podcast right now, but it just seems like people are so angry. Like, just like what Ibrahim was saying earlier, it's insane how divisive we are, right? Because if you guys actually listen to the podcast, we are not liberal and we are not conservative. Like, I will say like to my, like to you guys clearly, you know, there's some things I think of more democratic and there's some things I think of more Republican and that's just the way I am. And you know, my other two co-hosts here, I don't think they're straight Demo Democrats or I don't think they're straight Republicans. I think that things kind of sway depending on what topic it, what topic it is. And, you know, if you, if you go back to a video or two of ours, you'll see some hate comments on us. And it's like, first off, we're a small podcast facing, like, you know, explaining our opinion. There's no need to have hate. And if you guys go back to like the pod, uh, the, the TikTok and the real I, I made on our pod um, on Instagram and TikTok, you'll see like how I'm talking about the divisiveness between us. And, and it's insane. Like 85% of Americans believe that the United States is more divided than it is united. Okay. That's like the punchline here. That's brutal to hear. Okay, it's actually insane to see that majority of us believe that we are more divided. And honestly, it makes sense, right? We have the media guys and like information's expedited instantly and we can hear whatever we want uh, whenever we want, right? And just like reporters are obviously the media sending information out and they're trying to get the clicks, they're trying to get the views. And so they're saying things that are extremely divisive because that's what gets people's attention. It's not right. And it continues to happen. People continue to hate. And, you know, it just seems like resentment and anger, like bruising people. And they just want to go ahead and they won't say it to our face, right? I guarantee somebody won't go ahead and say it to my face if we're having this opinion in person. But when it is online, they're like, like the all powerful God, right? They can say whatever they want. They can say, you know, you deserve to die. Kyle deserved to shoot you. Like, what are you talking about? I I'm a human being just like you are explaining my opinion and i'm actually explaining why i have that opinion right rather than you guys going ahead and saying you're wrong and you should die because that's what i think or that's what's right like nobody you know actually have an opinion and actually back it up that's how conversation works it doesn't work by just spewing out you know bs and, and saying that you know saying hurtful things or things that are filled with resentment that's not what life's about that's not what democracy is about you yeah. know uh, i, I think I think just internet trolls are always just going to be a thing. And, you know, when you're behind that keyboard, you know, just typing away in your basement, you're going to have all the power in the world because you're anonymous, right? So I, I think that's always going to be a thing. But I, I agree with you. That shouldn't be a thing. And, you know, I always say, like, in comments, we're, look, us three, you know, we're not perfect. We, we all have our own opinions. You know, we back it up with what we believe. 100%. Right? It's fine if you guys disagree with us. Just comment, you know, just say what, what we, you, I disagree with you for X, Y, Z reasons, right? That's perfectly fine. I mean, that, that's how I think conversation should work. And that's why we're doing this podcast, you know. If you guys disagree with us, feel free to prove us wrong, you know, change our minds. We're open to that. But uh, I just feel like some, uh, some discourse uh, is not the correct way to do it. Uh, some, um, yeah, it's just... It's better to have a conversation rather than to be threatening, if that makes sense. That's just the world of social media, right? Like you were saying, I think um, this is always going to be the case. People are always going to be like, you know, um, in, in, especially in politically charged conversations, people tend to have like a really, really hardcore opinion and they feel threatened personally when their opinions are challenged and they kind of want to make it feel like, why isn't the other person thinking what I'm thinking? They're wrong. They're the problem. Like one of the people in our TikTok accounts, right? We posted a short video. Again, like that's the thing with TikTok is like when you're watching a really, really short video of someone explaining something, you're not going to be able to give the whole perspective or the whole story. And so I will admit that people are reacting to what you're posting. But one person just said that you are stupid, must be a Democrat. Hope he will visit, hope he will visit you. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I, again, like I, it, it's funny to me, right? I mean, but some people can like, you know, take it 
uh, seriously. And like, you know, but, but again, like we just have to be careful with this stuff. Cause I, I don't take it seriously. It's all again, like it's you just, said, at the just, end of the day, it's just internet trolls. It's just internet opinion. trolls. And You're like, right. People... But it's just, it's not right though. You know what I mean? Like it's wrong. Of course. I, so you guys know me, right? Like, like I'm the type of person that you say something, you're going to say it to my face. Don't talk behind my back. Cause that's just the way I am. And it just pisses me off that people are like, first off, I, I'm not the type to comment on anything, right? Whether I think something's good or bad, I just don't comment on anything. I, I enjoy the video for what it is at face value or what, whatever, right? But if I do comment something or if I say something, it's 100% something I will say to your face. And that's just the, that's the ticker. That's the ticker in me. Like, I don't understand why people are so confident behind a keyboard. Like, do you, do they realize that they're behind a keyboard? If they're in front of the person, you know, maybe something physical is going to happen and maybe they're going to get their ass beat. Like, that's just the reality. Right. And, and they don't care. And that's maybe that's just the old school mindset in me or whatever. But it's just that really irritates me. I, I don't get I don't get what goes on in somebody's head where they're able to type something out and not able to, like, back it up. Does that make sense? Because one, it's impulsive, right? When you see a video of someone and you disagree with it, it's really easy to just type it up and be like, hey, you know, you cuss them out or something or say like, hey, you're wrong, you're retarded or something along those lines. It's like, you know, that's obviously like insulting to the other person. It's really easy to type something up in 30 seconds. You forget about it. And I feel like psychologically, maybe we should interview someone who can speak more to this, but psychologically, I think it's maybe gratifying like sh on a short-term basis for them to make the other person feel down and they feel better about themselves. Like, oh, this guy is an idiot. I'm clearly more informed and I clear or I clearly have a superior opinion. So I think it has a very psychological basis. And a lot of us are now in tune with that, like, you know, way of life and practice, at least when it comes to social media. But back to the Kyle Rittenhouse case, I also want to just make a quick couple points. A lot of people say that Kyle was there to save businesses but Kyle was lying to people that he was a certified EMT and he accepted this in his testimony. When the prosecutor asked him, he said, I told him I was an EMT, but I was not. So he admitted that, that he was lying there. So when people say that Kyle was just there to protect people, to save businesses, the guy did, was not an EMT. Maybe he was CPR trained, man, but CPR trained does not mean you're a you're a certified EMT person, right? And so when people use that as an excuse to why Kyle was there, that makes no sense to me. And again, this guy, this kid, I will cut him some slack only because he was 17 years old. So I have sympathy for a 17 year old kid who's clearly not mature enough. But but I, again, I, I don't understand why he was there carrying an AR-15. I don't think that did anything. Carrying the AR-15 again, other protesters were also carrying guns, by the way. So it wasn't just Kyle. I would admit that. But to me, objectively speaking, there was no need for Kyle to be there carrying an AR-15. If he truly wanted to just be a medic, he could have done that. But again, in this testimony, guys, remember how he said, I picked up the AR-15 because why? Because it looked cool. It looked cool to him. That just goes to show, goes to show how immature he was and how much of an idiot he was. And maybe... You know, the prosecution should have honed in on that fact instead of like, like Janish was saying, using the fact that he played video games, violent video games or his TikTok account was something again, like his TikTok bio was, I'm just trying to be famous, bro. Like, again, like this kid is looking for attention. Um, again, I'm not going to use that as some sort of a fact to say, oh, he was going there to kill people. That's clearly not the case. There's also a lot of video of Kyle that was not admitted in trial. So there was a video of Kyle, like, you know, beating up punching a girl not related to this like earlier i don't know if you guys have seen that kyle was like beating up a girl or something it was like a there was a like, skirmish or fight and he threw punches at this girl there's a video again i don't know if this is like confirmed or there's audio of him saying hey man if i had a gun i would shoot at those protesters again that video evidence was not admitted in trial there's a difference between what was admitted in trial and what was not what, what, what what's considered legal uh in terms of the evidence and what's not and again i will admit some people say you know the law doesn't care about your feelings and that is accurate. It doesn't. So um, legally speaking, Kyle Rittenhouse says lawyers did an okay job of defending him. I just think the prosecution was so terrible, so terrible. It's such a, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, there was so much prosecutorial misconduct as Kyle was saying in Tucker to Tucker Carlson. I agree with him on that. Like, I don't know if you guys remember, but the prosecutor tried to use the fact that Kyle remained silent and, you know, was, didn't say anything after his arrest. I mean, that's 
literally a right protected by our constitution, the right to remain silent until you speak to your attorney and the right to, you know, plead the, uh, plead the fifth to, to remain silent. And so the prosecutor using that fact in court didn't make any sense to me. But again, the judge, like you said, Matt, last podcast, the judge clearly, you know, there, there's a difference between being, uh, you know, non-biased and kind of like the judge always kind of has to be harsh on the prosecutors since, you know, they have the burden to, to prove what they're charging, but still like the way he was acting, it was clear that he was really in favor of Kyle. Objectively speaking, right? Objectively speaking, they, people say that Schroeder, the name of the judge, like he's usually really harsh on lawyers. I get that. But objectively speaking, he was way too lenient towards the defense and way too harsh on the prosecutors, even though the prosecutors messed up and were just terrible. I admit that. But again, the judge did not act in a neutral way, in my opinion, objectively looking at this from a nonpartisan lens. I know. I also saw that a lot of lawyers were saying how they're they kind of prosecuted on the wrong charges. So you know, instead of maybe prosecuting on charge of like, um, you know, uh, violence or something, they could have uh, prosecuted on the charges of you know lying about the whole EMT thing or some other charges, right? So uh, a lot of lawyers were also saying about that. Also read somewhere else, it was in like you know you're going to law school, Ibrahim. They said law school professors are going to use this trial to show what not to do if you're a prosecutor and that i I was like yeah that's probably gonna happen in the future it just on the legal basis it's it's mind-boggling to me that you know he wasn't doing anything illegal carrying that ar-15 being under the age of 18 a wisconsin statute lets people carry those guns for hunting purposes guns that are like larger than 16 inches or something like that so ar-15 qualified under that uh under that um uh, code so, of law so which makes I, no sense to me if i pull up with the ar there i would be fine right yeah because it's an if open I had a, if I had a weapons my license. understanding yeah if i had a weapons license obviously okay so i mean it makes no sense to me like right i mean like the, it is legal i get it i get it right but again like makes you even zero need a weapons license i don't think you i don't think you do you don't? i think no i think you just need a hunting license which is like 50 bucks well that's crazy yeah. That's that's pretty universal, but I, I th- you know I agree with you guys. I just think it was a terrible case overall, and I think it was just very poorly executed. It could have been a lot different. Um, again, I just don't I don't know if it deserved the traction it got. Maybe because it was just during such a divisive time period, like BLM. Maybe that's why it gained so much traction. Um, but I just think that there's a lot bigger you know things to tackle, and th- this was just one of many things that happen every single day. And of course it deserves some importance. That's why it's in court. Right. But I don't know if it deserves the momentum that it gained. And, you know, maybe it is just a, uh, just a case to take away our time while something else is, is going on behind the scenes. You know, I, I don't want to like spend too much time on this, but I just want to say that looking at this case and like the comments of the various politicians and, you know, news media anchors, And again, like I was looking at this, I'm a registered, I mean, I'm not a registered independent. I'm just, I'm not, I'm an independent. I'm not registered Democrat or Republican. So I was kind of like trying my best to look at, look through this from a nonpartisan lens. Uh, And I know I used that term before, but I'm going to keep using it because I don't want anybody saying that I'm a Democrat or Republican because I'm I'm not either. I'm an independent. But my point is people were just rushing to conclusions based on their preconceived notions, they really wanted their opinions to be justified on both sides of the aisle. And, and it kind of like just showed me how people in media really do not have the best interests of the American people at heart. They really have the best interests of their, of their uh, ideological scale and the people that they agree with on, on, on their mind. They really don't care about the truth, honestly. They more so care about giving their opinions and, 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 you know, just rushing to conclusions on both sides of the scale, like they're both guilty of this, the left and the right, you know, clearly the news media in the beginning, yes, CNN and MSNBC, they clearly uh, were wrong about Kyle, I would, I would go as far to say they lied about Kyle Rittenhouse, they did, but then Fox News idolizing this kid and like, making it look like he is this great kid who never messed up in life, right, and came to Kenosha to save, to save the city of Kenosha. That's just not being honest. And people who are supporting Kyle because of that fact makes no sense to me, you know? And and again, I have sympathy for Kyle because he is going to have to live with this 
for the rest of his life. You could clearly see he has PTSD in, in, during the trial. I don't know if he now feels remorseful because um, it almost felt like he was just crying. I don't know if he, if he felt remorseful. I didn't see that in him. I just saw him giving the vibe that, hey, man, it's not my fault. You know, it's not my fault, right? Am I right on that? Like, that was kind of the vibe he was giving. Like, again, I do accept that he was crying, sure, for himself. But it almost felt like he felt so bad for himself that he wasn't thinking about what he did. Do you guys agree with that? It, it, that's just my, like, opinion on what I saw. It was just more like he was having a kind of flashbacks. That's what it happened to me. Like, that's what how I saw it. It's just like, he's having flashbacks and he's seeing all these, like, you know, things would happen when he, when he shot up people. And not, and not because because he shot the other guy i think he's just kind of you know that was a hectic moment in his life obviously so that's why that's what i think yeah i gotta disagree with that when i wa i watched it a couple times <clears throat> of him crying and i do not think that was real at all i feel like that was an extreme like pity cry i don't i don't even i don't want to say pity i think it was just him like acting the fool i think he tried to cry to prove some you know incite some emotion out of the jurors or out of you know, the viewers, I don't agree that it was real. You know, you, you see his face. He's like crying, like blinking, like crazy. I just, I don't think it was even, I don't think it was remotely real. I don't, I, I believe, I, you know, he said in the Tucker Carlson uh, interview that people thought that his defense um, that he, you know, got with the prosecutor and they created this strong defense or self-defense thing prior, you know, maybe that didn't happen, but obviously he, he's, you know, when he's on the defense, when he's on the stand, he's like, he's not dumb, right? He's not sharp, but he's not dumb either. And I think he has enough sense to know that if a question is asked like that and you start crying, that's for sure going to incite some emotion. That's just what happens, right? You cry, people naturally feel bad for you. And I, I don't believe it was real. I just think he looked like a clown while crying. Yeah, it was fascinating because defendants usually don't take the stand. They never testify in on you know during their own trial. So that was fascinating to see. But again, man, like I'll give him that. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't. Like in my opinion, to me, again, looked like the kid really was just felt bad for himself. But did you guys see when they read the verdict to him, not guilty? Like how he just like kind of. Do you think that was fake too? Like how he was like kind of broke down and he, you guys saw the video, right? Like he was crying. And That's for sure down. real. I would be enthused. I would be like praying to god i'd you know, i'd be extremely happy yeah, right I, maybe real, i would man. break down like like that's extremely strong case right and how divisive everything is for sure you think like, that the I mean, last video of him breaking down was real that that was well that yeah, was, oh, yeah I mean, for sure that's that's his life you know like the 60 years of jail <laughs> versus nothing like I, anybody would break down i feel like no see i think i i think it he his crying was real again like i don't think he he's this like i don't think he's smart enough to i don't think the kid's smart enough to to feel or think or think that far uh, again, like again, the kid's an idiot, immature, messed up. Two people are dead because of what he did. And he has to live with it for the rest of his life. The law says he's not guilty. And yeah, you know what? Some people might agree with that. And some people might disagree, but at the end of the day, he's going to have to live with what he did. And, and I don't um, pity him for that. So that's my, I think that's yeah, no pity. Experience. All right, let's move on. So uh, let's move on to some supply chain and some things going on in the economy. <laughs> so, okay. Kyle Rittenhouse to the supply chain, huh? <laughs> the supply chain, buddy. That That's my cup of tea. Okay. So supply chain is super interesting. I mean, obviously, we, we see what's going on. Things are extremely expensive. Um, I'm currently kind of browsing around, looking at cars, kind of, you know, looking to buy a car soon. And I was actually test driving a, um, the 4 Series earlier today, the BMW 4 Series. And I was talking to the sales guy and, you know, obviously like supply chain issues are, are a problem. And so if you order a car online, it takes three to four months, or you can get it there where there's limited supply, but you also have to play, pay a premium. So the premium ended up being 30% higher rather than if I just waited th three months. Right. So, I mean, personally, I'm going to wait three months. I'm not going to pay an additional $300 a month. I don't, I don't care that much about the, you know, for the next three months, but it's just crazy to me because, you know, there's dozens of ships, cargo ships sitting at the long beach port, sitting at the port of LA and things are not expediting, right? We have these like industrial warehouses and we have these freight and, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how interested you guys are in this, but logistics companies, they're popping out left and right. And it's extremely crazy how, uh, how fast they're getting business. 
Okay. They, first off, they're getting business so fast that the, the ports are able to pay, are able to charge a 10 times premium, right? So say it was $2,000. Now it's $20,000 in order to get a cargo, uh, a, you know, cargo, it's called a TEU, uh, to each unit. Uh, it's a, uh, no, how a two equivalent unit, right? So 20 equivalent unit, meaning 20 feet to, okay, whatever doesn't regardless. So the, the cargo ships, right? Each cargo, uh, each car, uh, cargo box is $20,000 to get off the port. And these companies are paying that. That just shows how much these freight companies are earning, how much these cargo ships are earning, how much everybody is earning, right? And, you know, we just see prices continue to raise, continue to raise. And, you know, finally, we're seeing some, some info back, um, so, uh, info. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard my dad come in. Um, we're starting to see some uh, labor come back into play. And which is true, we are, you know, people are getting back to work because, you know, the, the what's it called? Uh, the, uh, what is it? The unemployment. The unemployment's finally done, Joe. Cut that off. Uh, stimulus check, you know, is finally done. And so we're starting to see people go back to work and, or not go back to work, right? They're just, they're taking advantage of the system more because there are like the PUA, I think it was called like the pandemic unemployment aid. People are still taking advantage of that. And that's still in the system, but it's just crazy that there's more money in the economy, yet the least amount of labor in the economy as well. Um, yeah. So what, what do you guys think? What, what do you guys think about this whole car thing? Like, do you think it's realistic to see 30, per, not realistic, but do you think it's proper to see 30% higher markups on cars? Like how insane is that? So what I don't know much about like the logistic companies and the freight companies, right? But what I am well aware of is the uh, chip shortage around the world. And you can see that with uh, graphics cards, uh, with uh, CPUs, these are all like computer parts to build computers. And um, obviously modern day cars are heavily relied on electronic systems within them, right? And it just seems like it's kind of, I mean, yeah, there's a shortage in everything. And of course these car companies are having a hard time getting access to these electronic chips. And this is gonna result in a shortage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and, and from what I'm aware is this shortage is also going to last through 2022. Uh, I read some reports on um, the shortages for um, chip manufacturing companies, and um, it's looking pretty bad because it just feels like uh, 2023, 2023, right? Yeah. yeah. No, so some two, people are two more years. No. So I, I, you might've read that in one, from one source, some sources are saying like 2024, it's been crazy because um, these companies, I think the whole pandemic and then all these like different things that just piled on together. And these, these companies are just not keeping up with demand. Yeah, it, it is. Um, so I was just reading an article on CNN business and they were talking about how it's also a labor shortage. Um, a lot of these, at least in auto making, you know, you need, uh, you know, you need truck drivers to, you know, drive the, drive the shipping containers. And this is not just applies to truck drivers, but all across the United States, employers are having trouble finding the right people to work. And it just, there's not enough people in the labor force to fill those current jobs. Um, again, like you said, Matt, that there's, um, you know, those plan shutdowns, supply, supplying issue, the supply chain issues stem from partially, you know, COVID related. Uh, not enough, not enough plants are still running up and running. And those that causes like logistical issues, um, shortages of ships in general, like ships, like at the port in general, like there's not enough ships to house all the all, all the equipment or, or the necessary, um, you know, material that they need or, or cars in general. And then again, um, I think there's an estimate that um, because of the supply chain problems, automakers are going to make less than 7.7 .7 million fewer vehicles globally than they would have. So 7.7 .7 million cars, right? Um, negative. That's that's an insane number. And so I do, I, I, I do think the supply chain is improving, right? I think it's improving. But again, I, I tend to agree that it's going to take at least a year more or, or a year and a half more to have some semblance of normality. I don't know what that will look like, but that's that's my opinion.
but it's it's expected. Like I'm not surprised by it at this point. I am surprised that uh, you know it's gonna drag on to 2024. From what you're saying, I don't think it's gonna go into 2024. But if it does, that will be kind of surprising to me. Yeah, for sure. It's brutal, man. I think like on top of what you're saying of you know obviously there's labor shortages and COVID had to stop some manufacturing, right? I think it's crazier because there was an influx of money that was coming in. <clears throat> and what happens when there's an influx of money, people buy more stuff because they have more money in their bank accounts. And when people are buying more money, but manufacturing manufacturers aren't actually manufacturing the product, then that creates backflow. And now there's not enough product to get overseas to get to us in order for us to have. Right. And so that's what happened with all the port. So I don't think there's necessarily a shortage of ships because our ships like store a lot of, you know, a lot of cargo. Um, I think the real issue is, you know, first off what you're saying, the trucking, right? There's like, I don't know if there's enough trucks out there. Right. And, and as I was saying, legit. So well, logistics really is, if people aren't aware, logistics is kind of transferring, you know, from, you know, going from China onto the boat into, you know, mainland, you know, United States or whatever country you may be going from. From there, you know, the truck driver picks up the cargo and then takes it to the warehouse. From the warehouse, it's picked up by a smaller truck and that product is shipped out to the customer, to you guys. And so I think what's happening is we're seeing such a backflow of product because people were buying a lot of stuff, not getting it in time. Manufacturers didn't have that overhead. They didn't have enough product to, to because, so there's something called just in time. And if you're in the business world or if you're in logistics or, you know, if you know anything about economics, just in time, that's the way the world was working. Okay. So what just in time really means is companies will, will make product just in time for the consumer to buy it. Right. So there's always a, uh, you know, flow of product, but what happened was since so many people were influxing, you know, buying stuff that that model doesn't work anymore. So now what they are actually shifting to, it's called just in case. So they're actually making more product just in case it sells, right? Uh, not necessarily it will. I mean, in this day and age, it's going to sell regardless of what it is because of how much money is in the economy. But uh, I just think that's interesting that they're changing their whole inventory management system because of COVID, because of how much money was in the economy and, you know... It, FYI, let's move into let's move into the housing market, right? So I was reading, I don't know if you guys know what Redfin is, but do you guys know what Redfin is by chance? No, I'm not aware. No. Okay, so so what Redfin is, it's the modern brokerage. So you don't you no longer need a Keller Williams, you no longer need a Century 21, a Collier's. You have this thing called Redfin. And basically what it is is it's a website you type in your exact needs, an agent will be supplied to you. You don't have to go look for a solid agent. This agent will be supplied to you. They will tell you what you want. I mean, they'll tell you, you know, the exact preferences you want, and then they'll send you uh, whatever, whatever info online. So you don't really even need to, you know, browse for homes anymore. You can literally go online and check for things online, whether you like the house or not. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think if you're buying a house, you should at least go and feel like it's homey, like it feels like home. Um, I think that's extremely important. But regardless, we're moving to a digital age and Redfin is coming up big time. And so the crazy thing, what Redfin just said is that obviously things aren't going to slow down. Interest rates are going up. So that we're going to see a three point, about 3.6% increase over the next year. Um, sorry, not increase. It'll be at 3.6%, right? We're currently under 3% interest rate, which is historically low. Um, not as low as it was earlier this year, but historically low nonetheless. Uh, so next year will be about 3.6%. And when that's going to do, that's going to stabilize the high prices, right? So what we're seeing, what we're seeing was extremely high price. We're seeing million dollar homes with, oh, you know, sometimes 1.5% interest rate. That's bonkers, right? That's ideal. I mean, if, if you have, if you're looking to buy a house, you want that because that means you're, you're paying, um, you know, you're paying towards the home, right? You're not paying the banks, you're paying towards your principal, which is, you know, ideal. You want to pay for your house, not the interest rate, but the higher the interest rate goes, that just shows for, you know, stabilization. So the government's trying to stabilize. My issue with that specific um, problem is what that's going to do so we're obviously at the highest housing market we've ever been in, right? And what by stabilizing the interest rate, 
that's going to leave the housing market at a high price. And I don't know if that's okay because obviously people are struggling to buy houses as is right now. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Do you think that's, that's fine to try to stabilize the market at, at, you know, the prices it's at now? I mean, the prices are like super high right now. I feel like if, uh, you know, like your traditional family, you know, making like 60, 70 K a year, especially in California, it's like impossible to buy a house at this point. Like, I mean, uh, the down payment, like, think about it. Even if you put 10% on like a set, like to get even like a decent house, you have to like in this area, like where we live LA around there, it has to be, it's like a decent house, like $700,000. Right. And at seven hundred thousand dollars, a down down payment is like seventy thousand dollars, which is a lot of money for like a you know a, a family that's Minimum. making av- average right. income, right? Yeah. So I, I don't think I, sh- I I hope the prices are lowered because not not just for you know people just because the housing market, but just for people who want to actually buy houses and not just live in apartments their whole lives. I I'm just so. Uh, on this issue, I did want to break uh, bring up the point that Biden, President Biden, just renominated Jerome Powell to be the Fed chair again. Again, like the Fed chair serves four year terms, and he nom- Yep, Jerome Powell, Money Powell, uh, he is going to be the Fed chair again for the next four years. And I actually agree with this move because I actually genuinely think that Jerome Powell has operated in a nonpartisan way in terms of. But whether it be his actions regarding setting the interest rates, again, like the central bank controls monetary policy. And so I actually agree with, you know, a lot of the things that Jerome Powell has done. Again, definitely he can do more uh, in terms of regulation and stuff like that. But going back to your point, uh, Jerome Powell has consistently said that inflation is transitory and um, that the supply chain issues will eventually become better, you know, but, but I have noticed the Fed is, you know, increasing a little bit changing their tone in terms for for inflation it's definitely going to it's definitely more deeper than i think the fed had anticipated um in terms of what that means for american families i really think like genuinely again think that this is just a period of time that's tough economically for american families and that it will surpass eventually uh and, and that um the government has really done uh, during the pandemic, what they could have done, they could have definitely done more, but they didn't do a terrible job in terms of uh, economically to support American families. I think they did an okay job. And this is, inflation was bound to happen. I'm not surprised. And so this is short term. It's not long term. That's my I, opinion. I just think, I don't know if the house prices are going to go down at this point. It just seems like, uh, unless there's some crazy uh, bubble crash that's going to happen in the future, which I don't think in, in anytime soon, but who knows? Maybe, Matt, you have a better perspective on this. So what I think is going to happen is I don't think it'll be like this forever. I think there's been an influx of money in the economy and people have taken advantage of this downturn. And that's why houses are being bought. And, you know, international. So we're at the highest point where international um, uh, citizens are buying, you know, property in the U.S. They're buying it more than they have ever bought before. And there's a lot of foreign money. Okay, there is a lot of foreign money. And those are the people that are buying these houses in order to catch the investment, right? Because they believe, whatever they believe, regardless, right? What I do think is going to happen is I think eventually things will event- will simmer down because there won't be as much money um, stimulating in the economy. But you know what won't change? <laughs> so check this out. Because people can't afford houses, they're going to be renting, right? And what are the renter, what are the rent, the landlords going to do in those in those apartments? Because they, the citizens have no choice to, but to rent. The so they're going to, exactly. Over the next year, how, apartments and rent rentals are going to increase by over 7%. Do you, that's insane. I, I don't know if you guys yeah, registered that. For, 7% for one year is insane. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Our inflation is t- average 2 to 3% increasing a year, right? So, you know, it's not ideal to increase your rents two to 3%. That's kind of like, eh, you don't want to do that because you want to keep your renter. But to double that, you know, double your three, <clears throat> your high 3% into 7%, that's bonkers, right? That's a lot of money that, that's being increased. And what usually, usually when you rent um, a house out or you rent an apartment out, so say, you, you know, you're spending $2,000 or say you're spending $1,000 
uh, a month, right? On renting. And now, you know, next year it's going to be a thousand seventy dollars, right? 70%, right? 7% plus a thousand dollars, a thousand seventy. So now it's a thousand seventy. That thousand seventy, even when the housing market will decrease, that thousand seventy will still be there. Because people will still have no choice but to pay for that rent. They're not going to go ahead and buy a house because they don't have, you know, $50,000 to put down, $100,000 to put down on a house. And so they'll have no choice. There's going to be kind of a, um, I don't want to say a triage, but I, and I don't want to say like a market, uh, market uh, not ceiling, right? But a floor. You don't, I don't want to say a market floor for these prices. But if I'm a landlord and Genesis is a landlord and Ibrahim's a landlord, and we're charging, say I'm charging 1,070, Genesis is charging a 1,200 and Ibram is charging 1,100. We're not going to want to decrease hours, right? Because then other person is going to decrease and then the cycle continues, you're going to continue to decrease in order to beat the other person. So what's going to happen is you're just going to say, hey guys, let's just keep it as is. And then we'll still, you know, um, inflow, we'll still have an inflow of more money rather than not having the inflow at all. That's just some basic economics. Um, but yeah, I, I just think, go ahead. Yeah, quickly, I wanted to point out real quick, uh, you talked about a Redfin, right, where, you know, they assign um, brokers, to, uh, I mean, uh, brokers, right, you said, or Agent, agents, yeah. sorry, agents, yeah, they, they assign agents to, like, if you want to buy a house, they'll just assign an agent to me, right? Uh, do you know, like, if that, that's the first company to do that, do that, implement that technology? I feel like Zillow should have done that, or is that just me? <laughs> I feel like so. so Redfin has just been the most efficient with it. I think uh, I think Keller Williams tried before because Keller Williams is the largest brokerage in in the country. Uh, they're just not as efficient because they didn't start off that way. And you know, there's some older guys running Keller Williams, and there's some older guys running Century Twenty One. So they're more traditionalist. But the guys that um, started Redfin, they're more. I don't I don't know if they're millennials, but they're definitely more in touch with the internet and you know digitalizing things. Um, they've honestly done an efficient job. And by the way, Zillow. So, you know, sure, Zillow. Okay, I don't think Zillow should be a Redfin because I don't think that I think they're more traditional based, even though they're online and, and digital based. What they're really good at is showing people property, right? And, you know, posting property. I don't think they're necessarily good at uh, being a broker because what brokerage entails is negotiation. And I don't necessarily think that Zillow has that inherent, if that makes sense. But if Redfin, if they started off as a brokerage, they understand negotiation is part of being a broker, being part of being an agent, right? And so that's inherent in their values, in their mission, right? In their mission as, as a Redfin uh, broker. And so I, I think that it makes more sense for this, uh, for Redfin, a newer company to do that rather than Zillow. Yeah, I see. So it's pretty much like kind of um, the skill of brokerage is harder to like learn then, you know, skill of um, like for Zillow would be way harder to go into the broker business rather than uh, from Redfin to go from broker to being more technological based and then implementing their brokers. Knowledge. 100% dude, 100% right, right. because brokerage is a skill, right? But Zillow has, it's an, I don't know if you know what the MLS is, right? But the MLS is, you know, multiple listing site. And so it's really easy to put, all you do for Zillow is you put information into a website and then that website you know, shows what people want and people look what they want. And so that, that it's not really a skill, you know, it, it's just information to be, to be used. And so Redfin goes ahead and utilizes that information uh, in their brokerage skill. Uh, cool. Yeah. You guys want to move on? Yeah. I mean, the last thing I want to just cover real quick, uh, I saw a recent story and um, this is actually really interesting. It's some geopolitical affairs. Um Russia, so U.S. intelligence has found that Russia is slowly moving troops into Ukraine and around that area. And uh, this was kind of seen from 2014. U.S. intelligence have kind of reported that, you know, Russia's interested in, you know, going to Ukraine and claiming the land and, you know, maybe even uh, taking over possibly, right? And um, so right now they've seen more in their like satellite maps, they've seen more uh, Russian uh, soldiers and infantry going towards that side of ukraine and um you know the uh, u.s is kind of wor worried because if uh you know uh russia gets power over ukraine that's like another huge territory under uh, russia's hand and that just makes them more powerful and you know the whole um 
the, the U- U.S. has also talked with NATO about this potential, um, you know, uh, if, if this would happen, what they would do. They haven't really said what they would do, but I mean, um, maybe they would, you know, supply Ukraine with uh, troops or, you know, military equipment. I don't know. But anyways, the, pretty much the whole idea of Russia going to Ukraine and taking over, what, what do you guys think this entails in terms of just Russia, you know, trying to grow or just gain more power? Or is it just, uh, you know, just a move to try to get noticed by other countries? What do you guys think about that? So what you're referring to, just want to update the, so, you know, you're talking about according to the head of Ukraine's defense, defense intelligence agency, Russia has more than 92,000 troops around Ukraine's borders and is preparing for an attack by the end of January or beginning of February. So that's Ukrainian intelligence. And you said it's been confirmed by American intelligence, Jenner? Yeah, so, so what I've, the, uh, the article I read was uh, uh-huh. with U.S. intelligence. It wasn't even Ukraine intelligence. It was okay. U.S. intelligence analyzing the maps of Russia and Ukraine and noticing the shift of these uh, units into Ukraine's territory around the borders. Yeah, listen, um, Vladimir Putin is, say what you want about him, the man is smart, uh, you know, and he is a dictator. And so he wants Russia to have power and influence. And this, I don't know if this is going to happen because there's intelligence on a lot of things and sometimes it's not credible. And so because I haven't done my due diligence on this topic, just from a... um, really really like basic perspective i i my opinion in vladimir putin is he's a dictator who misses the time of the cold war when the ussr formerly the soviet union had a lot of influence throughout the world and so he kind of wants to take russia back to that time period and clearly in this current day and age russia does not have the influence or power that it once did economically it's a really weak country it's 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 you know uh, it doesn't have a middle class, you know, Russia is a lot of people, Russians suffer economically. Um, and, and Russia has done this in the past. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Crimea, right? Russia invaded Crimea back during President Obama's administration, and it has continued its aggression to its, uh, you know, to, you know, towards the west side where Ukraine is located. I think Ukraine is north southeast, so it's like kind of like southwestern. Ukraine is right here, or I don't. It's hard to like tell the viewers, but I, th- I believe Ukraine is to the west of Russia, and so Russia has done this in the past, and they'll continue to do so. Um, I don't know if the U.S. needs to be directly involved. I mean, it definitely is because of NATO and because of our alliances with a lot of European nations. Uh, but it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. Um, but again, I just haven't done my due diligence on this specific so, story, so I don't want to comment further, but that's just my general impression. Just some background information, just as well. If you guys didn't know, Ukraine is pretty huge. I mean, it's a huge territory. And it just to give it more perspective, it's west, it's southwest of Russia, and it borders Belarus, Poland, and Romania. So those are the borders uh, of Ukraine. For sure. Again, like, just like Ibram said, I haven't done my due diligence either. Um, I think that was funny that you said you don't want to comment further. But uh, regardless, I, I think uh, I 100% agree. I think I refuse Putin to it- comment further. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, that was pretty common. Um, so uh, what I think is I think Putin, you know, misses the days where his power meant something. And it definitely does mean something, right? He's arguably the richest man in the world, um, you know, arguably one of the most powerful men in the world, depending on who you talk to. Right. And that, that's not a joke. That's something serious to play with. That's not something serious to play with. Right. But what I do think is um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm what we're seeing, right. We're seeing a lot of tactics like the last 10 years. I want to say uh, it just seems like there's an information war and it, there just seems like there's war um, that, that's a cyber war, right? Like exactly what we're talking about. And I don't know what his game plan is obviously, um, but what I do think is he's just trying to gain some more traction, gain some more power in case there's a third world war, which I don't think he would, he, I don't think he would mind. I, I think he'd be okay with it. Right. Um, you, again, he's a dictator and he's just, you know, he, he's trying to gain more land, more land means more power historically. 
and nah, so he's not yeah. he's not a dictator man he just got all the votes man just like he did for the last like 20 elections he's just been getting all the votes man <laughs> yeah i mean he gets hey, like 75 percent of the vote uh, hey, hey hey whatever you want to say about the guy russians love the dude they love him man i i don't you know, know i talk i did i dude i'm telling you bro i talked to i was so funny story uh, a couple years ago or i think last year right but be- right before covid happened i went fishing um at the huntington beach pier and there was a ukrainian guy and a russian guy and they were talking about putin and they were like infatuated with this man they thought he was the epitome of power they thought he was the epitome of a man's man and they thought he was doing an excellent job um they, they don't believe that he's you know they don't yeah i, I mean obviously uh, information over there it is different than information we receive, but regardless, they like the guy. You know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the information they're being told. They enjoy his presidency, presidency, and they enjoy his, his tyrannical reign. <laughs> so look, whatever you want to say, it's, it's happening. I think people maybe like his personality and the way he presents himself. He's presents himself as this like macho strong man. He's a former KGB guy. KGB being their like CIA version of intelligence agency. I don't think that the average Russian appreciates the, the state of the Russian country in terms of the economy, in terms of how much power they have and how, you know, again, like Russia is suffering economically and they have been for the last decade. It's not doing well. The middle class there doesn't exist in my opinion. Um, and going back to your point, Jenish, on the Ukraine stuff, Russia has conducted aggressive actions against Ukraine. Again, like I said, in 2014, they illegally essentially annexed Crimea, which is to the south of Ukraine. And it's funny, I was reading an article about this, and <laughs> Moscow dismissed these latest concerns. They said it was alarmist, quote, alarmist. And so they were, they're dismissing this. Again, Vladimir Putin lies. He lies. He's a professional liar, and he is like so good at it that you can't even tell he's lying. And so Russians lie all the time. I do think that this is concerning. If this is true, 92,000 Russian troops have amassed. If this is actually true, this is definitely should be concerning. And, and you know, Putin is hard to predict. The guy is hard to predict. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, he Russians influence in our elections all the time. Uh, and I, United States does in other elections as well. But Putin's a smart guy, and I don't know what he's doing here. I Again, I just have to do my due diligence to, to look more into this. But I, wait, I wait, wait, wait. So you think... 92,000 Russians surrounding a third world country is scary. You, you think it's concerning? Third world country. I mean, Ukraine, I don't know if it would fall under the category of a third world. Regardless, underdeveloped, right? Underdeveloped. They're, they're not, they're not, I don't Russian. know. They're not US. That was a joke. I just thought it was funny. Obviously, it's concerning. Obviously, it's scary. I mean, if I was a Ukrainian president and 92,000 troops were surrounding my country, <laughs> I'd be trying to figure out a game plan. Like, I don't know what's going to happen here. Well, the thing is, like, the Ukrainian government, it's not really, it's, I don't know, it's not, it's it's corrupt. The Ukrainian uh, government's corrupt. I believe the past president, not the one currently, the before that, he was essentially a Russian puppet. There's a lot of, like, politics that goes into it. And maybe we should talk about this in depth next time, because it is very interesting uh, to, to, you know, talk about these things, which can actually influence, unlike the Kyle Rittenhouse case, it can influence geopolitics. So it'll be interesting to see. There'll probably be more info out too by the next podcast. Yeah, it will be. I think it's a good right. note. Sounds good, guys. It's a good note, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, you know, try to be kind in the comment section. Um, some of you, some of you, like barely one or two people, but you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good, guys. See you next week. Take care.